Um, but my job today is um, to introduce you to you today to, to Professor Ian Wicks, uh, a slightly daunting prospect. Ian is my uh, boss, and uh, so I can't say uh, too much, but uh, to, to point out that uh, Ian is the head of rheumatology at the University of Melbourne and uh, also a division head here at the Walter and Eliza Hall Institute. And his research truly spans um, both of those fields from the very, uh, you know, fundamental aspects of um, functions of inflammatory proteins and cytokines in uh, mouse models of arthritis and other inflammatory conditions through to, uh, you know, the, the, the translational studies and, and even various molecules that are now potentially uh, in the clinic, um, which I'm sure he's going to tell you a bit more about today. So thanks very much, Ian. Thanks, Seth. Sure, I know how everything works. Great. Well, well, thanks very much uh, for the introduction. And um, this is my topic, so it's um, it's it's quite a, a large topic, and there are there are kind of lots of things to potentially uh, talk about. But what I thought I'd do is uh, just introduce rheumatoid arthritis as a good example of the complexities of uh, chronic inflammatory uh, diseases. And I, I wanted to highlight the introduction, uh, hi highlight the introduction into clinical practice of cytokine antagonists. And perhaps surprisingly, um, this has uh, really been revolutionary um, when we think of the cartoons that we all draw about cytokine networks and inflammatory processes. The uh, the impact of um, antagonising individual cytokines. Uh, at least in some cases, has really been uh, remarkable. So I wanted to just dwell on that a little bit in the case of uh, TNF in particular, but then move on to describe some um, new potential cytokine uh, targets uh, for treating uh, chronic inflammatory diseases. Uh, not all patients respond to um, agents such as TNF antagonists, and so uh, we and, and lots of other people around the world are very excited about exploring potential new targets. So, uh, so I think that's what I've just told you. So um, inflammation, uh, why study it? I guess for a long time it was thought to be a reasonably boring kind of uh, process um, and probably very simple, but I think that that's been uh, a very mistaken uh, philosophy. And I guess it comes about because whilst uh, acute inflammation is a, uh, a temporary response to injury or infection to restore homeostasis, it's now clear that chronic inflammation is a pivotal component of many important diseases, uh, including rheumatoid arthritis. And, and as a result, there's great interest in how um, inflammation um, contributes to uh, a wide spectrum of diseases, uh, RA, as I've mentioned, but going right through to uh, diseases like cancer and uh, atherosclerosis. And a whole lot of uh, mechanisms uh, being explored, but I guess the basic uh, end uh, result is this failure to adequately resolve inflammation, leading to uh, tissue dysfunction or tissue damage and contributing to chronicity of disease. So uh, rheumatoid arthritis is an example of one of these chronic uh, inflammatory conditions that uh, once started persists uh, for decades and is probably a lifelong condition. Uh, it's very common, uh, about 1% of the world's population and can come on at any age, including in children and the elderly, but typically in the early adult years. Um, and then, as I say, it uh, tends to be persistent and essentially a lifelong condition. It's thought to um, be autoimmune in terms of its pathogenesis, although there's still a lot that we don't know about those early uh, inciting events. What we have learned a lot more about is the, the chronic phase and the synovial inflammation and the mediators of that and, uh, and of progressive uh, joint damage. Um, it's important to... Um, to remember that this, these sorts of diseases have major effects on uh, people in terms of their daily lives, um, in addition to the sort of biological aspects that we um, tend to think about. Maybe I'll use this. Um, no. Nope. Um, there, there are high rates of um, things like uh, inability to participate in productive work, family life, um, the development of depression, etc. Uh, very important, obviously, for patients and, and clinical care. 
Um, rheumatoid arthritis doesn't only target joints. There's a variety of extra-articular features, such as rheumatoid nodules, uh, inflammation of blood vessels or vasculitis, and there can be a whole slew of complications in other organs, including the eyes and the, the lungs, etc. Um, there is an enhanced uh, mortality attached to uh, having rheumatoid arthritis. Um, this is uh, quite, quite significant compared to age and sex matched um, uh, peers in the community. And it's mainly due to accelerated atherosclerosis, but doesn't seem to be due to the typical risk factors that we associate with, um, with atherosclerosis. So it seems to have a different uh, pathogenesis. So what does it look like clinically? This is a patient with um, early uh, rheumatoid arthritis, and you can see, I can't quite see it clearly here, but the synovial uh, joint uh, swelling involving the, the knuckle joints. Um, if you had a look into those joints with an arthroscope, and, and um, this can be done even into those uh, small joints in the hand, you would see this, these progressive changes looking down the arthroscope into the joint. So these are the cartilage surfaces that you can see here. And this is the synovial membrane, which becomes um, hyperplastic um, red because it's um, edematous and, um, and uh, filled with new blood vessels. So angiogenesis is a very typical feature of rheumatoid arthritis. And then over time, this frond-like uh, proliferation of synovial tissue occurs, which becomes locally invasive and destructive, and then over time, progressively fibrotic um, associated with joint, uh, joint damage. So if you took a biopsy, um, this is the sort of picture that you see, and uh, there's a, a number of important changes here. So normally this synovial layer um, is only a, a few cells thick, but it becomes dr dramatically hyperplastic in rheumatoid arthritis. There's the angiogenesis, uh, these new blood vessels that I mentioned, and a chronic inflammatory cell infiltrate um, down here. Um, in some cases, almost organising into ectopic lymphoid type um, structures. If you ground this tissue up and look by microarray or um, other techniques, you would see a, a whole variety of um, acute and chronic inflammatory mediators um, in this uh, edematous chronically inflamed tissue. So um, over time, this is what happens to the joint. So this is a, a pretty normal joint here with the, with the joint space between the ends of the opposing bones filled with cartilage. Um, over time, there are some subtle changes uh, with joint space uh, narrowing and some uh, local osteoporosis around this joint as well as the soft tissue swelling um, around the joint. And then you start to see this degradation of uh, bone um, around the joint and now loss of cartilage. And this is what happens if um, rheumatoid arthritis is not adequately treated. So it goes from the kind of early mild picture that I showed you previously through, um, uh, through these dramatic changes where essentially the joints are uh, destroyed and uh, useless. This um, patient's uh, quality of life, uh, you can imagine, being profoundly impaired. These are the uh, rheumatoid nodules that I mentioned. So um, th this was actually a reasonably common outcome um, in the past. And, uh, and when, certainly when I was a registrar training, we would regularly see people like this um, in the clinic, in wheelchairs, um, unable to uh, work uh, with their lives essentially having been ruined by this disease. So, um, so what's, what's uh, going on here? Um, this is the target anatomical structure um, in rheumatoid arthritis, namely the synovial joint, which, is, uh, which occurs between the ends of, a, of opposing bones, and it's a specialised anatomical compartment that allows movement. So it's a low friction environment filled with synovial fluid, which is secreted by this uh, layer here of the synovial membrane. And it allows, um, it allows low friction movement that we all uh, depend on, take, take for granted. So what happens in rheumatoid arthritis? It becomes infiltrated by inflammatory cells, and there's a, a variety of these found in the uh, joint, uh, the synovial membrane and in the synovial space. There's activation of the resident cells, so local fibroblast macrophages, uh, 
uh, chondrocytes in the articular cartilage and osteoclasts in the uh, surrounding bone all become activated and um, essentially uh, initiate a tissue remodeling uh, type of program, which some people have actually compared to malignant uh, cell behavior, uh, where the structures of the joint are progressively destroyed. So um, what do we know of, uh, in terms of uh, pathogenesis? Well, this is a, a big and complex and controversial um, area, but this is an attempt to uh, divide the compartments up into the um, lymph nodes where we think um, the autoimmune disease process uh, begins and the synovial lining here, which is the target in rheumatoid arthritis. And so here you have um, um, antigen reactive uh, T and B cells uh, being presented with antigens. We're not entirely sure what those antigens are in rheumatoid arthritis. Um, a fascinating feature that's emerged um, is the loss of tolerance to citronellinated um, self-antigens. That seems to be a major feature of rheumatoid arthritis, but we don't understand really how and, and why um, that occurs. But then there's the migration of these autoreactive cells into the uh, target tissue, namely the synovial lining uh, shown here where they encounter other antigen-presenting cells. There are dendritic cells and macrophages in the synovial lining. Uh, there's the generation then of local inflammation with the activation of the resident cells that I uh, told you about earlier, probably setting up a cycle of ongoing and repetitive damage and modification of self-constituents uh, so that you get the generation of damps and pamps um, fueling uh, this process as these uh, local cells become active and uh, modify or damage and destroy uh, local self components. Um, connections to the lymph node are enhanced. There's the um, generation of angiogenesis, um, as, as I mentioned earlier. So this chronic inflammatory cycle uh, becomes established. Um, outside of the joint, um, major uh, systemic effects uh, progressively occur. So um, you have a series of metabolic effects um, on the liver, on uh, fat and uh, muscle, uh, can, all contributing to this accelerated atherosclerosis, which is the major cause of premature mortality um, in rheumatoid arthritis, um, as well as uh, psychological effects, uh, probably uh, related uh, fairly directly to cytokine actions on, on the brain and uh, osteoporosis and the risk of fracture in bone. So traditional therapies have been uh, pretty empirical for rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, their agents such as uh, methotrexate and gold borrowed from other clinical disciplines, methotrexate from oncology, gold from the pre-antibiotic um, era when it was used as a, an antibiotic for tuberculosis, and uh, these agents were found just empirically to have beneficial effects in rheumatoid arthritis and remain the mainstay of treatment for many decades. Agents such as non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, which you would have heard about, um, uh, cortisone, um, uh, corticosteroids such as prednisone, have symptom-modifying effects that it can be very beneficial, but they don't have disease-modifying effects, so um, they're not of value in switching the disease off. So the big advance on that empirical approach, uh, very inadequate, um, unsatisfactory for clinicians and patients approach, has been the recognition of the pivotal role of inflammatory cytokines and the introduction um, of cytokine antagonists. And I'm just going to take you through this story. Um, don't worry about trying to read the details. I'll, I'll um, try to highlight it for you. But it's a timeline. Uh, that a pioneer in this area, Mark Feldman, an um, ex Wehi alumnus uh, working in the UK, uh, drew up um, summarising history of TNF antagonists. And this started with, uh, this started with the observation, once um, individual cytokines could be measured, that synovial tissue produced a lot of cytokines um, when put into in vitro culture, um, and that included TNF. And... It was found that with antibodies um, against uh, TNF that the um, other cytokine levels were reduced uh, uh, when TNF was blocked in these cultures. 
that led uh, fortuitously um, an anti antibody that had um, failed in trials of sepsis uh, was available at that time for clinical evaluation in rheumatoid arthritis. And that uh, looked very promising in small uh, studies that led on to larger phase two studies and um, eventually to, um, uh, to very large clinical trials that established that this indeed was a uh, safe and effective treatment other diseases such as Crohn's disease, Crohn's disease of the bowel uh, were, were then evaluated. And over the space of about 10 years, I think all that activity occurred over, um, this led to hundreds of thousands and now literally millions of patients being treated with TNF um, antagonists and it really has been revolutionary. So this works by um, inhibiting various uh, um, arms of uh, TNF signaling um, either by uh, in antagonising the, uh, uh, the cytokine itself or a soluble version of the cell membrane receptor um, antagonising uh, cell surface signalling and all of these approaches have been pursued. And that, that has uh, led to the development of a number of blockbuster drugs. So these are billion dollar a year type um, uh, drugs that have really, as I say, revolutionised uh, clinical practice. And uh, there's three or four shown up here targeting um, a, uh, TNF. Um, there's, as a result of all of this activity, been a lot of interest in other targets. So other um, uh, monoclonals have been introduced uh, uh, into practice uh, targeting uh, things like B cells, um, IL-6 and co-stimulatory pathways. What started in rheumatoid rheumatoid arthritis has now spread to other chronic inflammatory diseases such as uh, psoriasis, psoriatic arthritis, Crohn's disease, uh, et cetera. And this is a picture just to illustrate the sort of, um, it's a bit cheesy, I guess, but it does, it does illustrate the difference that it can make to a young person to get effective control of a disease process such as this. This person um, uh, can be taught to administer a TNF antagonist subcutaneously now every fortnight or uh, some, in some cases uh, once a month. Uh, and so this, compared to the pictures that I showed you earlier, uh, really has been a revolutionary uh, change. So um, this led, I suppose, to uh, a lot of uh, discussion about uh, cytokine hierarchies and how, how does this whole uh, process, which on the face of it seems so chaotic and complicated, uh, boil down to the uh, effectiveness of, uh, of being able to block uh, one particular cytokine? And this, I suppose, was the TNF school um, led by, uh, uh, understandably, by, by Mark Feldman and co-workers, where TNF was felt to be a master switch in the cytokine hierarchies that uh, un underlie a disease such as rheumatoid arthritis, governing the production of other mediators in a pivotal controlling sort of way. But I guess there was scepticism about that uh, claim um, and you would wonder about its evolutionary value, I suppose, to, to have so much invested in one particular cytokine. And I guess the reality has been that a substantial um, number of patients don't actually respond uh, to TNF antagonists in spite of them being very useful for uh, perhaps the majority, 30 or 40% of patients don't get an adequate response or fail to respond at all. And we evaluated that claim, I guess, di directly in TNF knockout mice where we were able to, um, uh, I'll tell you a little bit more about this model in a moment, generate um, uh, collagen-induced arthritis in the uh, background that the TNF knockouts were, were on. Um, and we showed that um, they, these mice, uh, simply by increasing the uh, degree of uh, the concentration of mycobacterium tuberculosis, which is part of the adjuvant that's used to immunise these mice, uh, that these uh, TNF knockout mice were uh, just as susceptible uh, perhaps some slight delay in the onset of disease, but certainly could develop severe uh, collagen-induced arthritis. So um, with that background, I uh, 
I, I, and as I say, I really want, want to highlight the, uh, the value and the importance um, of TNF antagonists. Uh, the impact that that has made clinically really has been revolutionary. But it has, I think, uh, been the first uh, stage um, in an ongoing um, area um, uh, of great interest. And I just w want to turn now to some new uh, cytokine targets and start um, with uh, the colony stimulating factors, well known um, to everyone here at WEHI for their role in the maturation and proliferation of uh, hemopoietic progenitor cells. They also have a, 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 a variety of effects um, outside of the, the, these progenitor cells in the bone marrow compartment, so on the mature cells uh, from in the hemopoietic lineages to suppress apoptosis, uh, to induce uh, differentiation and, and commitment, and then a variety of uh, effects on functional stimulation of these mature cells, such as enhancement of phagocytosis, superoxide production, uh, and the production of other um, mediators. And um, the one that uh, has generated most interest uh, for us, at least initially, has been uh, GMCSF. And uh, you would have all heard about GMCSS as, as a hemopoietic growth factor. It's actually used for that property um, in the clinic. And so it stimulates the uh, multipotent bone marrow progenitors to differentiate into mature myeloid cells, and it stimulates uh, granulocyte uh, production as well. It's uh, used in vitro as a growth factor for dendritic cells. It's produced by a wide variety um, of uh, cells in the body, including, as I'll mention, T cells. Um, and that production is especially in response to inflammatory stimuli. Um, there doesn't seem to be a whole lot of uh, basal uh, GM production, but it goes up dramatically with, infl with inflammation. Uh, what data is there in terms of rheumatoid arthritis? Well, we know that administering GM-CSF to patients with rheumatoid arthritis who need it uh, for various reasons, including um, neutropenia, uh, can um, exacerbate rheumatoid arthritis. There are um, elevated levels in joint fluid and tissue, um, and it ca its production can be induced by uh, in synovial cells. This shows you some immunohistochemistry showing the synovial membrane staining uh, for GMCSF alongside of some other cytokine mediators. And this is a, an early study looking at these synovial fibroblasts uh, derived from joint tissue stimulated with IL-1 or TNF singly or in combination. And you can see that the combination in particular um, uh, switches on GMCSF production quite dramatically um, in these cells. So how to test for the role of a, a mediator such as GMCSF in rheumatoid arthritis? We have this correlative human clinical evidence but um, the gold standard mouse model, and this has been a very informative model, is collagen-induced arthritis generated by autoimmunity to type 2 collagen, which is a uh, cartilage-specific uh, molecule. Um, we, in conjunction with um, uh, John Hamilton's lab, were um, able to show that the MHC restriction, which was thought to be overriding and to limit, uh, DBA, uh, limit the model to DBA1 mice could actually be overcome and uh, the model can, can uh, be made to work in black six mice, which opened up analysis of a whole lot of uh, uh, knockout mice, including TNF knockouts that I've, that I've mentioned. Um, so uh, the type 2 collagen is administered as a prime and then a boost uh, immunization in the presence of uh, Freund's adjuvant, and then a chronic polyarthritis begins um, about a month later. It's autoimmune in nature. Uh, T cells and B cells are required, and it can be assessed clinically and histologically. So this shows you the prime um, and the boost immunization. You can omit the boost and then a molecule that you're trying to evaluate for a negative effect, such as, a, say, for example, a SOX molecule, you can see enhanced disease. Or if you're looking for the positive contribution of a mediator such as GMCSF, you can do both the prime and the boost and look for a reduction in disease in the absence of that positive uh, factor. Uh, this shows you the sort of clinical uh, features of inflammation in the mice. These are the histological features, so similar to what I showed you in the human joint with the joint space, the cartilage and the sur surrounding synovial tissue. 
and that can be graded uh, histologically. So this shows experiments from uh, John Hamilton's lab at the University of Melbourne, uh, done by Ian Campbell, um, where uh, GMCCF uh, knockout mice were subjected to this model. And you can see in the open circles here compared to the closed circles, the wild type mice, that disease um, incidence and disease severity was dramatically reduced in the knockout uh, mice. Uh, John followed that up in work um, done by Andrew Cook, where uh, in a more clinically relevant scenario, the mice were wild type mice were allowed to develop arthritis and then treated with a GMCSF antibody, um, starting uh, with established disease. And you can see here in the closed um, closed uh, symbols that the progression of um, of arthritis in the mice. Uh, seen here in the isotype control group was blunted when GMCSF uh, was blocked. And that, just to give you um, a comparison, that compares very favourably to the same sort of experiment that was done with anti-TNF um, here in the early 90s and was part of the rationale for introducing TNF antagonists um, into clinical trials. So. Um, it uh, has a major, GMCSF deficiency or antagonism certainly has a major effect in, in this model of human rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, they weren't head-to-head -head experiments, but it looks on the face of it uh, just as effective as anti-TNF. Um, in these uh, mice, the immune response to type 2 collagen uh, was actually um, intact, so it looked like an effector phase um, mechanism and it provided a good rationale for thinking about human clinical trials. So we, were, we came into the story, I guess, at that point and um, had uh, the ability, I suppose, through work that had been done at WEHI to um, think about the, the receptor for GMCSF as a, um, as a therapeutic approach. Um, these things depend, uh, once you start thinking about clinical trials and the engagement of commercial partners on having a position. And uh, WEHI was fortunate in, through work done by Nick Nicola and Dave Gearing in that the alpha chain, the ligand binding chain of the GMCSF receptor had been uh, discovered um, here at WEHI. And uh, we had antibodies against that receptor um, and that allowed a, a, us to a, a platform um, to pursue um, this, this as a therapeutic target. Tim Herk has told you about this um, heterodimeric um, receptor family a few weeks ago, so I won't uh, labour uh, the point. The important thing from our point of view was that uh, the alpha chain was available as a potential <coughs> target. And uh, to cut a long story short, uh, this was initially... Um, uh, started as uh, through the CRC for growth factors when Doug was the, the chair of that um, outfit. Um, AMRAD, as it was called in those days, subsequently Zenith, Cambridge Antibody Technology were engaged to, to uh, work on this um, strategy and that led to a, um, um, an antibody called CAM-3001 uh, initially that, and subsequently to a fully um, human IgG4 monoclonal antibody that potently antagonised GMCSF uh, binding to uh, the alpha chain. IgG4 was chosen as the isotype because it um, is the, has the least ability to activate complement. And there was obviously some concern um, initially um, to avoid any um, lytic effects um, on receptor-bearing um, cells. So that, uh, those early partnerships evolved then into um, ongoing partnerships with Metamune, um, AstraZeneca, uh, CSL, uh, which uh, acquired uh, Zenith, um, and obviously with, with uh, Wehi involved throughout. And the antibody was renamed at some stage Mavrilimumab. Uh, all of these antibodies have unpronounceable names. So um, this shows you, uh, I won't dwell on the early... Um, early work, but this shows you, I think, some very exciting clinical data of a phase two study. So this uh, was of several hundred patients with moderately severe rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, 
And these clinical trials are done with a composite set of composite criteria. So the number of tender and swollen joints are counted, uh, pain scales are assessed, laboratory features of acute um, uh, uh, inflammatory markers such as ESR and CRP are all rolled into composite markers that, you, that are then the basis of your response criteria in clinical trials. And so these patients had active disease when they were entered into the trial. Uh, they were treated with uh, GMCSF um, um, receptor um, uh, antibody at varying doses uh, with um, a, a placebo control. Um, and then in a blinded fashion, their response was assessed over 12 weeks and they were in fact followed up for uh, 24 weeks. Treatment was stopped at 12 weeks. So the initial um, uh, end point was a reduction in this composite uh, disease activity score of greater than 1.2. And then uh, greater uh, responses than that were, were also evaluated. So this is busy, but if you just look at the high dose, highest dose here of mavrolumumab, which is in the red, compared to the placebo, which is in the black, this is the primary endpoint here, of a, a, uh, and that was met by about 65% of the mavrolumumab-treated uh, patients. And then there's a, a medium sort of level of response here, but then uh, the response that we're, we get very excited about is when they, the patients actually get so low in their clinical activity measures that they regarded as being in remission. And if you look at the um, mavrolumumab-treated group here, it's about 25%, I think, compared to the placebo group of being 5 or 6%. So really a very dramatic response um, was found um, in this clinical trial. So... Uh, very exciting, and this uh, phase two study has recently been reproduced in a different ethnic group um, uh, in Japan, and now head-to-head um, -head, uh, studies are being uh, organised uh, with mavrolumumab compared to TNF antagonists, so a very exciting time. One observation in these clinical trials was of a very rapid effect on pain. That often, often lags behind a bit uh, when TNF is... Um, uh, targeted in rheumatoid arthritis. And it turns out that there is previous literature on this association between hemopoietic um, uh, growth factors and, uh, and pain. And this is a study of a sarcoma model um, in mice where pain responses were assessed um, when G and GMCSF were antagonised. And this is, the, uh, this is the normal response shown up, shown up here in response to a painful stimulus. And you can see that when these two hemopoietic growth factor signaling pathways were antagonised, there was a, quite a dramatic effect on um, the pain um, response in the animals. And there was also an effect um, uh, when these uh, growth factors were antagonised actually on tumour volume. The authors went on to show that nerves, uh, sensory nerve endings had uh, G and GM-CSF receptors, um, which is sort of quite extraordinary, uh, but uh, looked convincing. Um, tumours can also um, have these receptors. Um, some tumours are associated with high local production of G and GM-CSF. Um, many tumours have an inflammatory cell infiltrate that uh, potentially could be producing uh, these cytokines and feeding into the tumour cells, the sensory nerve endings and um, bone uh, remodelling cells such as um, osteoclasts. So a fascinating area, I think, that was a complete surprise. And this, this sort of um, uh, net, network could potentially explain the very rapid effect of GMCSF antagonism on pain that was observed in the, in the clinical trials. So um, I want to move on, uh, and I've, because this is such a big topic, I've tried to look for some connections um, between the different cytokines. And the next one I want to talk about is IL-17. Um, I'm just going to go through this quickly. I'm sure a lot of you are aware of this new um, T-cell subset um, and it's, uh, it's a fascinating story in its own right. It really seems to be a subset of uh, T cells that's very intimately associated with tissue inflammation. So rather than perhaps the 
shaping of an adaptive immune response. It seems to have a pivotal role in shaping uh, tissue inflammation and damage. Turns out, very surprisingly, I think, um, that GMCSF is probably a pivotal part of this type of uh, this T cell subset. This was revealed in a set of um, a couple of landmark studies in EAE, which is the animal model of multiple sclerosis, where uh, raw gamma T, the uh, transcription factor that drives the TH17 uh, subset of, of T cells, was found to also drive GMCSF. Uh, production and in fact the ability to induce disease in EAE through uh, T cells um, that were uh, reactive to the MOG um, autoantigen that was used to generate uh, this model of, um, of MS, uh, that uh, they were really critically dependent on IL-23 induced production of GMCSF. IL-23 is a, a one of the master cytokines that shapes the generation of the, of the TH17 lineage. So this is just shown here in this cartoon where IL-23 production by a dendritic cell stimulates um, a, a T cell to make GMCSF. Dendritic cells have receptors for GMCSF but don't produce, don't seem to produce it. Uh, but a T cell uh, producing it will stimulate a dendritic cell. It also stimulates the recruitment and activation of a variety of myeloid cells into the central nervous system in this model contributing to uh, CNS inflammation. We took this one step further by making a T cell transgenic uh, with GMCSF um, overexpressed in T cells and there was really very dramatic pathology where essentially uh, multiple organs throughout the body became infiltrated by histiocytic cells, which are um, cells that combine features of DCs and, and uh, macrophages. So these histiocytic cells infiltrated lymph nodes, thymus, um, and, uh, and the lungs. And so that's, that was a very interesting observation because there are, there are a variety of uh, poorly understood and poorly treated histiocytic disorders in humans where GMCSF may be potentially a target. Um, so this it turns out to be a, quite a large family, uh, the IL-17 family. There are six members. I'm not sure that all of them are shown um, um, on this cartoon, but um, there are six members of the family. A lot of the biology is still being worked out. IL-17A and IL-17F um, are probably the two uh, best studied. They're produced, in, in fact, by a variety of T cells, so including uh, not just T helper cells, but cytotoxic T cells, gamma delta uh, T cells, a variety of innate uh, lymphoid cells and, and uh, other cells such as neutrophils and, and monocytes, as well as interestingly uh, stromal cells such as epithelial cells and panis, uh cells. So a whole variety of cells turn out to be able to in, uh, produce IL-17. The targets are particularly stromal cells, so shown here epithelial cells but also fat cells, uh, bone, uh, fibroblast, muscle, et cetera. So um, a very interesting connection between uh, the immune system and, uh, and tissue cells. So very, this uh, cytokine family seems very important in barrier defense. So if this is the gut or the lung or the skin uh, shown here, these uh, under the influence of cytokines such as IL-23 um, in particular, um, t t a variety of T cells switching on a number of mediators um, alongside of um, IL-17 and there, there's a, a, a suite of these um, obviously now including GMCSS, GMCSF as well as uh, molecules such as IL-22. That's important for barrier uh, defence. Um, uh, chemokine induction and GCSF induction and other, uh, other characteristic features of the activation of this family. Um, and in fact, neutrophil-rich inflammatory infiltrates are a recurring feature in TH17-associated uh, pathology. So in terms of rheumatoid arthritis, um, a variety of effects have been demonstrated on stromal cells such as endothelial cells, fibroblasts, macrophages, chondrocytes, osteoblasts. So a really fascinating array, uh, really essentially of tissue remodeling type responses in these stromal cells. So um, uh, the signaling uh, pathways um, uh, 
uh, uh, still being worked out. I think this is a, a work in progress, but just to summarise very quickly, um, uh, IL-17 can homo or hetero uh, dimerize. It, it um, interacts with a heterodimeric receptor. ACT-1 is a crucial um, adapter protein. It ubiquitinates uh, uh, TREF-6, uh, another uh, adapter protein, and uh, that leads to the activation of SEBP, uh, junk and NF-kappa B uh, pathways. There's a TAC1 complex dependent uh, step for NF-kappa B activation uh, that's uh, also involved. And uh, when NF-kappa B is activated uh, through this pathway, there's also an effect of a, uh, on a, a microRNA that normally suppresses uh, that complex and that's relieved leading to um, uh, uh, NF-kappa B uh, activation. There are also effects on messenger RNA uh, stabilization, so the sequestration of a uh, molecule that binds in the three prime region here that uh, normally destabilizes messenger RNA or the activation of an RNA stabilizing uh, molecule called um, HUR. So a fascinating um, uh, signaling uh, pathway net network. Um, in terms of um, animal models of disease, a very mixed picture. As you might imagine in uh, models of disease where the um, uh, barriers, the skin or the lungs or the gut are involved, there have been some mixed effects. In collagen-induced arthritis um, that I introduced earlier, uh, it did look um, to, to R17 does look to uh, be playing a uh, pathogenic role, but a lot of this work is, is still uh, continuing. What I did want to highlight was the clinical impact of uh, antagonising this pathway. Uh, there, has, there have been some clinical trials in rheumatoid arthritis, but probably the most exciting, where, where it looks uh, of, certainly of, um, of interest, but the most exciting results have actually been in psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis, which occurs in a subset of patients with uh, the skin form of psoriasis. And this just shows you a picture here of widespread psoriasis treated, this patient being treated with ustekinumab, which um, targets the shared P40 subunit uh, in common between IL-12 and IL-23. So it's not specific to IL-23, but this work has been followed up with more specific IL-17 um, and IL-23 antagonists. And this looks really very dramatic. So uh, a, a marked clearing of, of psoriasis, um, uh, a, a very impressive uh, clinical response, which has caused um, a lot of excitement. And um, it also turns out that I think a very interesting evolving story about the um, IL-23 responsive um, cells, uh, T cells, that are found in strange locations around the body, including in this um, enthesial area, which is where ligaments attach into bone and is a favoured site for some forms of inflammatory arthritis, such as psoriatic arthritis. And it turns out that there's a raw gamma T IL-23 responsive set of um, resident T cells in those locations, which could explain a lot of the pathology. So great interest in... Um, in IL-23, IL-17 antagonists in psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis. Now, just finally, I want to turn to um, GCSF, and um, I've already mentioned the connection with, um, with the TH17 pathway with GCSF and, and uh, chemokines that attract neutrophils being a very characteristic feature of uh, TH17-mediated pathology. So, once again, uh, a hemopoietic growth factor well known at wee high and with effects at all stages of the neutrophil life cycle from bone marrow differentiation uh, release through to circulation in the blood adhesion to um, blood vessel wall in sites of inflammation and then trafficking into the tissues where it has, um, uh, where neutrophils have these antimicrobial or pro-inflammatory Effects. So probably all aspects of the neutrophil uh, lifespan and, and behaviour are, are influenced in some way by GCSF. And I wanted to quickly mention here, um, once again, I can't really see it, but an, an interesting tie-up with, um, with the TH17 pathway um, where adhesion molecule deficient um, neutrophils uh, 
uh, unable to traffic into tissues um, were found to, uh, uh, to govern the production of IL-23, um, well, or rather these tissue infiltrating neutrophils were shown to govern the production of IL-23 by tissue macrophages and dendritic cells. Um, so tonic production of IL-23, um, unless uh, they're phagocytosing uh, tissue uh, neutrophils. So an interesting idea, um, the IL-23 then stimulating a variety of uh, T cells um, shown up here, but particularly in the gut and in the lungs uh, to produce IL-17, switch on GCSF and neutrophil production. So that was a proposed mechanism. I guess we haven't really um, had a good um, handle on GCSF and the control of um, uh, neutrophil production. Uh, and this, this is certainly an interesting model that's been proposed. And um, so it's been, it's been called the Nutristat, um, uh, where a sensing mechanism dependent on the uh, tissue um, infiltrating neutrophils undergoing apoptosis and being uh, phagocytosed by um, IL-23 producing cells um, setting the Nutristat. So um, neutrophils, what uh, can they contribute to inflammation? Well, it turns out a huge amount. Um, so they can make cytokines, including um, IL-17 uh, chemokines, propurdin. They're probably one of the major sources of propurdin, which stabilizes um, complement um, activation. Uh, famous, I guess, for, for other activities such as reactive oxygen, proteases, etc., all of which can um, encourage the recruitment of other inflammatory cells, damage uh, tissue, uh, and, and lead to the persistence of uh, tissue inflammation. So we um, were interested in the potential contribution of GCSF to, um, to uh, rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, as I showed you for GMCSF, there are clinical observations about administered GCSF flaring um, underlying uh, inflammatory diseases in patients. It does so um, in uh, rodent models of arthritis, and it's certainly found in joint tissue and joint fluid of RA patients. So in an analogous way to the, to the work that was done on GMCSF, we looked at GCSF knockouts. And this shows you a collagen-induced arthritis experiment with the animals observed over time. This is the um, wild-type response compared to the GCSF knockout response. And you can see profound protection in these uh, mice, which was um, corroborated by the histological assessment uh, of, their, of their joints. And we, we got similar results in GCSF receptor knockout um, animals. And we did a similar experiment um, in terms of allowing wild-type mice to develop collagen-induced arthritis and then introducing a GCSF antagonist. And in this experiment, we directly compared the effect of anti-TNF antibody to anti-GCSF antibody. And you can see uh, the control-treated mice, their arthritis progressed, whereas um, the GCSF uh, um, blockade mice were markedly protected and it looked equivalent to TNF blockade. So um, I, I'll just finish up quickly by by um, mentioning that we have found a protective effect in other inflammatory models. This is a model of uveitis, so inflammatory um, eye disease. This is the wild type response where you can see disruption of the layers at the, uh, in the retina at the back of the eye um, in a, a wild type response compared to GCSF uh, knockout animals uh, who were markedly protected. This is the um, neutrophilic infiltrate um, in those eyes when neutrophils are labelled and the retina is examined uh, uh, through an in vivo uh, microscopy approach. So that's the um, wild type response. This is when GCSF is antagonised. So the neutrophil infiltrate into the eye is, is markedly uh, reduced when GCSF was antagonised. And um, there's, there's not time to dwell on this, but it, it turns out that GCSF, one of the other roles of GCSF is probably um, dynamic regulation of chemokine receptors. So um, neutrophils depend for their um, movement from the bone marrow and their movement uh, through the circulation and into inflamed tissues on the dynamic balance of chemokine receptors. 
And this is the bone marrow compartment shown here. And normally there are retention signals mediated by a chemokine called CXCR4, recognising its um, chemokines such as CXCL12. Um, and that holds the neutrophil pool in the bone marrow. Um, when those neutrophils leave, uh, want to leave the bone marrow, they have to downregulate CXCR4, upregulate CXCR2, and that allows uh, responsiveness to a different group of cytokines that then draw neutrophils out of the bone marrow and into the circulation. And a similar mechanism operates when neutrophils uh, trafficking into uh, peripheral tissues. So they're dependent on CXCR2 and these um, sorts of, of chemokines to draw them into inflammatory sites. And uh, what Gabby Goldberg found was that uh, in GCSF knockout mice or anti-GCSF um, antibody treated mice, that this balance of chemokine receptors was markedly um, in favour uh, of the CXCR4 um, axis. So I'll finish now. Um, I wanted to mention that uh, whilst I've stressed um, monoclonal antibody uh, type approaches to targeting cytokines, there's obviously a huge amount of activity going on in, the, in targeting um, uh, in other targeting approaches, in particular small molecules targeting intracellular signaling pathways. And you've heard in this series um, about the, uh, the great excitement about uh, JAK um, inhibitors. Obviously, they'll um, inhibit uh, quite a broad range of cytokine responses because they're downstream of so many cytokine um, receptors. Uh, that could be very advantageous for um, chronic inflammation. It could um, be associated with uh, toxicity because so many mediators are being antagonised as opposed to um, monoclonal antibody approaches which are exquisitely specific. So I guess I wanted to, uh, whilst uh, you know, the small molecule approach is obviously uh, very exciting and we're involved in some potential approaches um, as well, this really, I think this era of therapeutic monoclonal antibodies is really has been revolutionary. I think it's the first uh, few chapters of what will be an ongoing story and it has had a major um, clinical impact. So I mentioned at the beginning to everyone's surprise when they thought that uh, cytokines could just be um, chaos. Um, targeting individual cytokines in some cases at least has had certainly uh, very dramatic effects. It remains early days, so there are, there are ongoing concerns about infections, about the long-term ability to control malignancies, um, reactivation of uh, latent viruses, etc. But on the whole, the clinical experience of the first 10 or uh, 15 years of using these agents has, has been reassuring. But we obviously need to keep a, a, a watching brief. I think there are many potential new, ta new targets. And the more we understand about the biology of these individual cytokines, uh, the uh, more rationally we'll be able to intervene. And it may be that different chronic inflammatory diseases have different pathways, perhaps at different stages um, of those diseases, the cytokine predominance uh, will vary. But um, uh, there's great hope that we'll be able to intervene in a much more disease-specific, uh, patient-specific uh, way um, in the future. So um, I'll, I'll stop. And it, it, there are a whole lot of uh, people to thank from, from my lab. Um, in particular, I want to highlight uh, the contribution of Kate Lawler when she was a PhD student and Joe Isles um, uh, in our work on GCSF um, ably um, assisted by uh, postdoc um, Ian Campbell. In terms of GMCSF, uh, Anne-Marie uh, uh, was uh, in, involved in our work, um, both in terms of the histiocytosis work and also in the evaluation, early evaluation of uh, mavrolumumab. Uh, once again, Ian Campbell was uh, involved in that work. I want to highlight uh, the contributions of um, a number of other people, in particular John Hamilton, whose lab really generated uh, the, the first kind of pivotal observations, on the, uh, particularly on the role of uh, GMCSF, but also the, um, the people here at WEHI who have uh, this long and, um, history of uh, interrogating the biology of hemopoietic growth factors. 
and I think have been very interested to see this new chapter um, develop uh, in terms of the potential contribution of those mediators to inflammation uh, as well as to hemopoiesis. The work has um, involved commercial partners um, and CSL in particular who've been a fantastic uh, outfit to, uh, for us to collaborate with uh, uh, too many people to mention individually, but a, but a great partner, I think, on the um, Parkville precinct for taking discoveries into this next stage. Uh, Murigen was a WeHi um, biotech spin-off uh, that was involved particularly early on in that um, uh, phase of the work with um, Zenith and, uh, and Cambridge Antibody Technology, and now Metamune, uh, an international uh, pharma that, that has been also a very uh, good partner in, um, in further uh, exploring the biology of, of GMCSF in particular. So I hope I haven't rushed too much. Um, uh, I'll finish up. Thanks. <laughs> GM or GCSF would work as an alternative or in combination perhaps uh, with those? Yeah, look, probably uh, as an alternative. Most There hasn't been a lot done on combinations of antagonists um, because I, I guess uh, safety concerns in particular, you're kind of knocking out too many pathways. Um, so uh, I, I, think the, I think the way these have generally been introduced is to take a TNF non-responder population, of which there's a substantial minority, um, and then to uh, expose them to the, <clears throat> you know, so to conclude that they're a failure of that antagonism of that pathway, and then to expose them to, to the um, new agent. How that's going to play out in the long run when you have multiple options, um, I think we're still a long way off. We don't have good biomarkers that might discriminate to, to know which one to choose. Uh, but that's certainly the hope that you might be able to come up with combinations of biomarkers that allow you to say, in this particular patient, at this particular stage of their rheumatoid arthritis or their psoriasis or whatever it is, you know, an anti-TNF is going to be the best option or an anti-IL-17 or whatever. But unfortunately, we're still a, a kind of way off um, uh, from making those sort of decisions, but certainly hope that that's the way it goes. So, as you said, Feldman's view was that uh, TNF was kind of the top of the pyramid in inducing all the other cytokines. But now you find that anti GCSF, anti GMCSF, anti R17, mm. anti TNF are all sort of equally effective, mm. but not much better than each other. So, mm. how, how do you interpret that in terms of? Very difficult, isn't it? And. Um, you know, so it's, there can't be that many masters, and and um, so I guess the only way I can, uh, and I and I don't think anyone's got a, a great explanation, but the only way I guess I tend to think about it is as a series of sort of feed forward loops where that seem to get you over perhaps a series of critical thresholds, and um, at least if you intervene in those feed forward loops early enough, you you're able to kind of switch off uh, downstream consequences. But I think it's, it's a fascinating question. I remember at the very beginning, people sort of just making that point and saying, look, this, this is complete chaos. Um, how are you going to make any impact by antagonizing TNF or, or whatever? And yet, you know, the, the uh, experience has, has borne it out. So I think it's a really interesting question as to how these, these hierarchies and networks are actually set up. As, a, as I mentioned, I don't think it makes any sense, evolutionary sense, to have one master uh, switch because it would make us too vulnerable. But how then all the loops um, interact, I, I, I think, is very difficult to conceptualise. A Nobel Prize, I suspect, in working it out. We're a little bit over time, so if there's no burning questions, I'll just leave it to everyone. Thank you.